Our second reading today comes from the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. And as you probably have suspect, this deals with Jesus and cleansing of the temple and John's version of that particular story. Listen for God's word through the Gospel of John. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and turned over their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews, the Jewish leadership, then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? Jesus answered, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The gospel of the Lord, and the people say, praise to you, O Christ. <clears throat> you've seen it on television, the pictures, or, or maybe you've experienced it firsthand. There by the stadium before the big game, you see those rows of semi-trailers, miles and miles of cable extending into the venue. Deep-throated generators are running loud and strong. The tech crews are scurrying around checking their connections. The media folks are hunched over their monitors checking their signals. The camera operators slide in behind their shiny machines with their fancy headsets. Now, can you imagine, uh, imagine if you can, someone with a giant pair of side cutters cutting all back through all those cables. Sparks fly, then the monitors go black, and the cameras stop. Would your thoughts go to the idea that someone was just cleansing the stadium? I doubt it. Would you say that someone had stopped the game? Well, for sure. Would you? We would likely ask in this time, is this a terrorist act? I'm sure that would cross your mind. But now let's reset the scene. It's now the first century in Jerusalem. We're preparing for Passover. We see lots of people who have come from all over the known world for the Passover festival in Jerusalem. You and I see lots of activity but nothing that's out of the ordinary. The vital trades are in place, the necessary exchange of monies, animals, and grains for the required sacrifices. Anyone can accept the temple system for the temple system to survive. These ordinary transactions of the marketplace are essential. The temple is to if the temple is to function as a place of exchange for maintaining and supporting the sacrificial structures, we need those functions, right? Well, Jesus enters the temple and finds just what you would expect during the pilgrimage festival, but he sees it differently. Now, if you're raised in the church, you probably have it embedded in your head the idea that Jesus sees corruption. People are not just selling animals, they are cheating other people as they did. In the Gospels of Matthew and Mark and Luke, Jesus borrows from the prophet Jeremiah to accuse those who are selling things of making the temple a den of robbers. 
Jesus raises a ruckus in the temple to protest corruption and to clean up the temple, at least for that day. In addition, it's important that for Matthew and Mark and Luke, this happens at the end of Jesus' ministry. They place the event as Jesus' final act, whereby the authorities make the decision to arrest and kill him. But the Gospel of John, what we read today, tells the story differently at a different time in his ministry and for a very different purpose. In John, this incident takes place very early in Jesus' ministry, just after his first miracle. You remember the one where he quietly changed water into wine at a wedding feast, the miracle that revealed who he was to his disciples, and they believed him. Again, in this episode in John, the cleansing of the temple has a different timing and outcome. The physical setting is the same, Jerusalem just before Passover. Jesus goes up to the city, apparently to attend the Passover festival, but his actions turn out to be one of an angry prophet, not an ordinary pilgrim. In John's gospel, this will do two things. It will both establish the start of his public ministry and change worship forever. Now, there are some real differences in what gets reported as actually happening and what doesn't happen as well. Listen again to what John has Jesus doing. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers over their tables, overturned their tables. He told those who were selling doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. What is noticeably noticeable is what's missing. Instead of the concern for the temple marketplace malpractices that den of robbers characterization, Jesus simply just orders that his father's house just stop serving as a marketplace. Cleansed in a very different way. But just like the necessity of those tables, those cables to the broadcasting of the game for the game to go on, if you and I were there, we would know for the temple to survive, the ordered transactions of the marketplace was essential. From a practical perspective, the temple just had to function as a place of exchange for maintaining and supporting the sacrificial structures of worship of the day. It was the centuries old structure of how God was worshiped by the Jewish people by sacrifice at the temple. In John, Jesus was not quibbling about malfeasance or mismanagement. In John, Jesus has something much larger in mind. Jesus calls for a complete dismantling of the entire system. Not clear to either the Jewish authorities or the disciples at the time, Jesus implies the temple itself is not necessary. Actually, at the center of Jesus' statement is the fundamental concept of God's location and hence location to direct or conduct our worship. This will be confirmed in the dialogue between Jesus and the Jew, Jewish authorities. Let's go there. The authorities essentially ask for some sort of proof that Jesus has the right to do what he just did and say what he just said. They ask for signs. Jesus answers them to them must have been totally perplexing. He says, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Can you not just hear the indignation in the response of the authorities? The Jews said, 
This temple has been under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days? If you are the reader, you find this confusing, and you can take heart with a lot of what Jesus says in the Gospel of John, like a lot of the other statements that Jesus makes, this line from Jesus does not clearly follow from what precedes it. We might ourselves, as I'm sure the disciples did, just stand there saying, huh? Who said anything about destroying the temple? Where did that come from? In the text, the narrator tries to help us out. When a narrator says he was speaking of the temple of his body. If you, like the Jewish authorities and likely the disciples, knew the temple to be the meeting place between God of Israel and God's people, if you knew this was the place where sacrifices were rightly offered during religious festivals, and also at special times in people's lives, <clears throat> such as to honor a birth or in thanksgiving for harvest, you knew the temple was the holy place. It was the place where human life and divine blessing met. That At that at time, this is what you thought you knew, thought was truth. However, according to John's gospel, that has all changed. After all, John begins his gospel with, the word became flesh and lived among us. Here in John, with the birth of Jesus of Nazareth, God's dwelling place is with human beings, as a human being, God incarnate, God in human form with us. In this text, Jesus baits the Jewish leaders was something likely beyond their comprehension. Jesus says, I dare you destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. For picking up what the disciples understood, the narrator again tries to help us. The narrator says, after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. So even the disciples did not fully get it at this particular time. <clears throat> well, for us now in this period of Lent, we can particularly be particularly aware the reference to the three days is a foreshadowing of the resurrection, but also the ascension. We are also aware Jerusalem, as a location of the temple, is just the place where Jesus completes his ministry through his crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. Jerusalem is just the place of his death. Jesus is telling the Jewish leaders, even if the temple has been your symbol of location in the presence of God, that has now changed. Jesus is now the presence of God, not the temple. Now, Jesus is the revelation of God, the one and only God. This will be continually reinforced by John in different setting sets, images, and different characters, and different directives, all pointing back to this essential truth. God is with us, incarnate in Jesus. The temple is no longer where the people meet God. The interesting version of the cleansing story to make a point, the temple is no longer where the people meet God. Well, as we back on to our own situation, it's soon gonna be a year that COVID-19, since COVID-19 put a stop to our physical meeting place, our temple, if you will, seemed like someone with a giant side cutters cut the cables, and we scrambled to continue the game. 
much like the Jewish leaders, I do not think we could comprehend what it would mean to our worship experience and to our ways of connecting to God. Let me be clear. I do not see this as on par with Jesus clearing the temple. I do not consider COVID-19 as a direct act of God. I do not see the image of God with a large set of side cutters or a large spray bottle of infectedness. COVID-19 is and continues to be very much a natural phenomena of our world. I do think what has happened does, however, give us opportunity to think carefully about many of the patterns of connection to God and to each other that we have. What are our temples? How do we worship? As we have opportunity, and hopefully in a not too distant future, to establish what will be our new patterns, I hope we will remember John's form of the cleansing of the temple story. Unlike the disciples and Jewish leaders at the time, we know the rest of the Jesus story. We know to whom we belong. Like the disciples after the resurrection, we can remember what he said. We can hear Jesus even now. We can believe the scriptures and the words that Jesus spoke. We can look beyond our old temples. We can follow him with energy and imagination. May it be so that we follow him with energy and imagination. Amen.